from the shores of Summer Lake in Tigard, Oregon. It's the Portland Tim Beers Podcast, a show featuring two guys who love craft beer and Portland Timbers soccer. And now, here are your hosts, Jason and Gary. Tim Beers, I'm Jason. And I'm Gary. We're the uh, Portland Tim Beers. We talk about soccer, beer, and pretty much whatever else we want. How you doing, buddy? Yeah, doing pretty good. How about yourself? Uh, living the dream. <laughs> Surviving COVID. The COVID dream. That's right. Well, uh, we haven't been here for a couple months. No, we haven't. If we were to play Aerosmith back in the saddle again, it would totally be <laughs> appropriate. Well, we got uh, all sorts of new and exciting stuff coming up for you folks. Uh, some of it we've had in the vault yes. for a couple months. Yep, unfortunately. Yeah, and uh, some of it we just recorded today. Yes. <laughs> Very fresh. Well, um, let's just jump into this bad boy. So a couple months ago, we had the chance of sitting down with a uh, fine young lad by the name of Evan Watts. Yes. And he owns Watts Brewing up in the uh, Seattle area. And so I was out with some friends up in the Seattle area, had uh, the chance to go to a pub, and at the pub uh, met this guy that knew somebody was in our party. And it uh, turns out he's the owner, Evan Watts from Ep Watts Brewing. So let's give it a whirl uh evan was kind enough to join us for an interview a couple months back and uh let's learn a little bit about his brewery so i'm jason uh this is from the portland tim beers and i'm here with gary my co-host and evan from watch brewing so evan how you doing man i'm doing great thanks for having me on things are yeah, a little weird right now but uh we're doing all right <laughs> yeah interesting times now so why don't you introduce yourself and your brewery to the listeners Great. Well, my name's Evan Watts, and my brewery is Watts Brewing Company, very creatively named. Uh, I'm up here in Bothell, Washington, started out as a little nano brewery, but we're expanding right now and getting some more beer out into the market and finally distributing kind of around the Seattle area. Fantastic. So uh, Bothell, Washington, where's that in relation to Seattle? Uh, so just northeast of Seattle. So you got uh, Lake Washington just east on the east side of Seattle, and it's on the north edge of that. So it's a suburb of Seattle, really. Yeah. Perfect. Good. So um, what beers is your brewery known for? So yeah, I know we're drinking a Kolsch that uh, you gave me a little while back, and it seems to be the one that you've uh, been awarded some medals on. So but what yeah, beers are right. you known for? Yeah, that would be the one. That's our flagship beer, the Leaf Cutter. It's kind of an Americanized take on a Kolsch. So lightly hoppy. We use Simcoe hops there which are just beautiful hops in general, popular in IPAs and pale ales, but uh, they really give that beer um, a lot of depth to it because Simcoe is one of those hops that just has so many things going on. A little bit of pine, a little bit of kind of a peachy fruitiness to it. Uh, you got a little bit of kind of grassy, earthy component to it as well. And so it's just a, a fan, fantastic hop to work with, but especially when you use such a small dose like that, you're able to really let it open up. Yeah, really, really so, uh Not not a lot of hoppy notes on it at all. So we talk about on the podcast, you can judge a brewery by how well the Kolsch is. Um, and, and this is a super, super clean, good Kolsch. Yeah, we've had a lot lot of uh, success with that beer, and, and people seem to love it. And we, as you were saying, we won gold at the Washington Beer Awards for that a while back. And, yeah, we're real proud of it. Excellent. So what is your favorite style of uh, beer to brew? So when you're looking at styles, obviously we had some success with the Kolsch's. Uh, with the Kolsch style, uh, what is the style yeah. that you kind of gravitate to, and what are you guys known for at your brewery? Yeah, I would say, you know, it's not necessarily a specific style of beer, but kind of our approach to brewing would be doing things that are um, kind of in that standard strength range, around 5%, um, but are still have a lot of depth to them. So finding ways to make everyday beers taste fantastic and, and interesting as well. So having layers to it, and I think our Red Mason Rye is a great example of that. Um, where it's it's a rye ale with the Kolsch yeast, kind of an amber color, and a um, Mount Hood hops with in, in that one that pairs really nicely with kind of the earthy, spicy qualities of the rye. So that you can see there are a lot of layers going on in that beer, and as you're tasting it, it's kind of unlike anything you've ever had. But at the same time, it's it's still beer. You know, we're working with those four major ingredients. You got the 
the malt, you got the hops, you got the water, and you got the yeast. And it's finding new ways to, to create new beers with those same kind of four ingredients and, and making them layered and approachable and delicious, most importantly. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, it's an those, interesting, those... interesting twist that you're using the, the cold yeast on that. Yeah, well, it's it's kind of got some similarities with an alt beer in that respect, you know, a clean fermenting German ale strain. Um, but, you know, you put the rye in there and it's then, of course, something completely different. <laughs> so it's, yeah, right. it's, it's not a, it doesn't really fit within a, a given style. And, and that's something that I kind of like to do is there's so much room for experimentation out there. It doesn't have to fit within one of those, you know, pre-box styles. And obviously those styles are there for a reason. It's things that have been proven and we know work, work really well together, but it's not the only ways to make beer. So talk to me about distribution. Are you doing any distribution or are you only serving beer out of the tap house at this point? We actually don't have a tap house. We're a distribution only. Oh, self distri- wow. Distributed. Okay. Yeah. Not the normal business plan, but, uh, you know, when I started the brewery, started out um, and some property that my, my dad owns, he raises bees for commercial pollination. So that's kind of where we get the theme for our brewery. Everything. If you look at our, our logo, it's a bee and everything we do is kind of bee themed. Um, so got sidetracked there. But uh, when we started the brewery, it was in, in a building that my dad owns up here in Bothell. And there wasn't space for a tap room. We didn't have a parking lot for that. So I was like, well, if this is what I have to get started with, we're going to do distribu- distribution only and kind of get to know the industry and make sure that our beers are top notch before we you know, start expanding things. So that's when we got started, um, just finding ways to get our beer out into the market. And that's self-distributing kegs to bars and restaurants. So this year, we've kind of expanded that. We partnered with another brewery. They let us install some bigger tanks down at their place, so I'm able to brew on their equipment and, and into our fermenters. And, uh, and so we're brewing a lot more beer, still distribution only, but they have a canning line. So they're letting me use that to put our beer in cans for the first time, which is critical uh, during this pandemic to be able to get our beer out to people. No, that's huge. I mean, that's massive to uh, jump on that. But we've heard from others that don't have or didn't have a uh, kind of a prepackaged model before COVID, and uh, we're stuck with, again, just slinging beers out of their tap room, and those folks are having a hard time. And so, yeah, you uh, yeah, there's going to be a... with, yeah, you start gold with being able to uh, have ta- or have uh, uh, kegs that you can distribute, but also this canning line. So that's huge. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, this is going to be a brutal winter for a lot of people, a lot of breweries and tap rooms, but also bars and restaurants that we serve. So nobody's immune to it, but we're just finding other ways to get beer directly to people. And, and so right now we're, we're actually selling beer on our website. We'll deliver it to you anywhere in the Seattle area. Um, I guess technically it's a 20-mile 20, uh, 20 radius around Bothell. But, uh, yeah, just trying to find ways to get beer to people. I'm going to have to keep a mental note of that as, uh, if I'm up in the Linwood area and say, hey, I need to yeah. walk beer. So. Yeah, you bet. So uh, what's the craziest beer that you've brewed? And when I say crazy, I'm talking about um, uh, maybe crazy styles, maybe maybe something crazy ingredients that came out of it, maybe a crazy brewing technique that you did. Uh, tell me about the craziest beer you've done. <laughs> well, <laughs> Uh, at, at the brewery, we try to stick with kind of the four ma- main ingredients. So I, I don't have, you know, any crazy war stories, uh, no stuck matches or anything like that to, to share with you. But a beer that we just released last week, Stingo, we call it. It's a uh, wood-aged strong ale aged on Spanish cedar and cypress. Um, so that's a really interesting beer. And, and being able to have access to some of those alternative woods to oak. You know, oak is really well known because it's used to make barrels, right? So we're really familiar with kind of the vanilla, sometimes a touch of cinnamon, or depending on which variety of oak, you know, there's some some options there that you have to play with. But there's so many other types of wood. Some you can use in beer, some you can't. But <laughs> we did some research during the, uh, uh, the first uh, COVID lockdown in March, April, May, and did some wood aging experiments with other types of wood and found that Spanish cedar was just a, a really beautiful, um, you know, the classic smell of cedar comes across well in beer. And cypress was like this yellow cake kind of smooth sweetness um, that it added to the beer. And, and together it just made a really nice strong ale. So so at the brewery, that's probably the, um, the most interesting ingredients we've used. But uh, home brewing one time, 
I, I tried to brew a Groot. That's one of those uh, uh, <laughs> Middle Ages beers from Northern Europe where it's flavored with uh, bog myrtle and Mirica Gale and Wormwood and all, Heather, all these uh, old herbs besides hops. And it turned out terrible. It was so bad. <laughs> <laughs> It it, wow. it sounds like a science experiment. Yeah, it pretty much was. It turned sour without the hops there um, to preserve it. Uh, we, we tried to use wormwood to kind of fill that niche, and it did not do as well as hops. So it, it turned sour over time. So it didn't taste good to begin with, though. It was not an experiment worth repeating or exploring further. <laughs> <laughs> so how many years have you been brew, brewing beer, and then – you know, were you a home brewer before? Do you have any formal trainings? No, self-taught. Started as a home brewer back in 2013. Um, so after college, I had a, a friend who helped me brew my first batch. And then from there, I was kind of on my own, learning online, reading books, absorbing information any way I could, experimenting. And then 2015, decided to start the brewery. And, and by uh, fall of 2016, really, I released the first batch of the Leaf Cutter, actually. Um, for our our launch party down at the Hop and Hound here in Bothell. Gotcha. Uh, did, give me a give me kind of a synopsis of what's going on with the C- Seattle brewing scene right now. Is it is there still growing? Is there a contraction? Is it holding its own during COVID? What's going on up there? Well, we're about to find out. We just um, just today announced the the latest round of uh, of closures for COVID. So we're going to see what happens here this winter. I think it's going to be pretty tough on a lot of people, but that doesn't mean breweries won't survive. I think it's a very competitive market. And so, you know, people have been saying it's saturated for a long time. So it's it's really hard to say, you know, how much beer is too much beer? Um, is there room for growth? We, nobody really knows. Um, we'll just kind of see where it goes. But uh, we're hoping that, that people will be able to survive this winter. So what does the future look like here? Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Jace. That that led right into that next question perfectly. Yeah, I mean, so specifically, so COVID obviously had an impact on you guys. COVID's had an impact on a lot of others, um, maybe more so or less than others. I mean, there's been some contracture in local markets, but what does the future look like for you guys? So when we look forward four or five years, what do you see your growth plan being? Well, our next step, is to build a new brewery. So we're, we've grown out of our current space, and, and that's why um, we've um, been uh, installing our tanks down at, at our friend's spot in Seattle um, so we can increase production. Like we're just we're out of space at our current location. So we were going to be building a new brewery this year, uh, but those plans got put on hold, thankfully. We uh, we were very lucky that COVID hit before we had signed a lease or, or purchased a piece of land or anything like that. So we're, we've got real low overhead right now, so we're just waiting it out, and we'll be all right And as, as soon as things start to look more normal and we uh, feel like COVID's under control and we can actually invest in a new brewery, that'll be the next step. So build, a, build out a tap room, production area, outdoor beer garden, bee garden, all that. So that we, want to have, we want to be able to have a place where you can come see where the beer, beer's made but also have a, an outdoor bee garden where you can get to know our bees. So the, the Watts family business, my grandpa started it 50 years ago, and now my dad runs a thing, is a, uh, a business raising solitary bees for commercial pollination. So solitary bees don't have a hive. They don't sting. They don't make honey. Uh, each individual female mm-hmm. lays her own nest. So they raise, raise these bees, leafcutter bees and mason bees in particular, and sell them to farmers to, to pollinate their crops. So we want to have a place where you can come see these bees in action and learn about how they uh, contribute to the food supply. Oh, fantastic story. That's awesome. So are you guys messing with mead or doing anything with mead at all? <laughs> no, our bees don't produce honey, so we actually uh, don't uh-huh. have any more honey than anybody else does. Uh, and it's, you know, our style is, is more with the classic, ing- at least for the beer, is with the, the classic ingredients. Um, right water, malt, hops, and yeast. So I, I've actually never brewed with honey, but it's not something that I'm necessarily opposed to. Someday we'll try it out. Yeah, it seems like a pretty natural fit with the bee theme and the bee montage. I mean, most people, I mean, for lack of a better 
better uh, pieces would have no idea that, again, mason bees don't produce honey that way, but <clears throat> seems like it would be a natural fit for you guys. So, Yeah, for um, sure. But it also gives us something to talk about, be able to teach be- people that, you know, these bees, bees aren't all about honey. A lot of what they right, do right. Um, for us as humans is, is actually contributing to the other foods we eat as well. Yeah, channeling the Bill Nye the Science Guy, right? They're all about pollination. Exactly. So, yeah. Now you know. <laughs> now you know. It's right. So favorite <laughs> beer you've had by a regional brewery. So something in the Seattle proper area. And uh, what do you what have you tried that you're digging lately? Oh man, so that's a tough one. I think the uh, what have I had lately that I was really impressed by is is probably the, the easier question. Um, and I, I had uh, a while back, so I don't, number one, I don't get out much anymore because I'm working all the time at the brewery, so I don't, I don't get to try everybody <laughs> else's beer as often as I'd like. But that being said, I finally got a chance to try uh, Wander Ale from Wander Brewing up in Bellingham, and so they distribute in the Seattle area, and it's a, a light Belgian ale. It was fantastic. You know, light, crisp, drinkable at the Belgian esters in there, and uh, the malt character was really nice. Real light, but kind of a brightness in the finish, and just the way the whole thing came together. Um, it, was, it was a great beer. Wonder Ale, interesting. So, yeah, we use that question to kind of tag who's going to be next, so I might have to take a trip up that way and try that out. So tell me yeah, about a favorite beer you've ever had. So any brewery whatsoever, what's your favorite beer? Oh, man. Uh the next one I'm about to drink. Uh, no, um, I have to have a stock answer to that question uh, just because there's so many good beers. So my, my stock answer to that question is uh, the uh, Firestone Walker Anniversary Ale. Each year they release a blend of, of all their different barrel age projects that they have going. They have some winemakers come in, and, and each team of winemakers does a different blend, and then they pick their favorite and release that as their anniversary ale for the year. And, you know, it's it might be a bit much, you know, and the, the production's more of a celebration than it is necessary for making a great beer. But what they produce is always fantastic, and it's it's one of my favorite beers. Now, that, that leads kind of into the next wonderful question that we'd love to ask um, a lot of the brewers is, if you could sit down and have a beer with two legends of beer brewing, alive or dead, who would they be and why? Hmm. I think there's a lot of a lot of great uh, scientists from kind of the history of beer that would be really interesting to to hear from. Um, you know, somebody like De Klerk or Pasteur or somebody like that. Um, was it Siedlmeyer from uh, Carlsberg who first isolated the first? Uh, or was he a, the other German guy? Anyway, the, the the guy from Carlsberg who first isolated lager yeast and decided to share it with the rest of the brewing community. That could be an interesting one. Yeah. But probably my, my first pick might be actually uh, Dr. Charlie Bamforth. Um, I I have, don't have any formal brewing training. He used to teach at uh, um, UC Davis as part of the, uh, the brewing program down there. But he just, you know, hearing interviews with him, he seems like such a, an entertaining guy and obviously knows a ton about beer. It'd be great to sit down and have a beer with him and talk shop. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. You went down the, the scientific path. Um, a lot of the guys go with uh, like the home brewer or the, the big brewer impact type guys. And I think it's really interesting that you went down that, that scientific side of it, which is really cool. Yeah. I, there's always somebody who knows more than beer about you. And I'm always trying to, to, to be learning and improve my beer that way. And everybody has their artistic sense, but necessarily copy or copying somebody else's artistic sense doesn't necessarily help me get further ahead at what I want to do. We're all trying to kind of forge our own path. So sometimes it's interesting to hear, you know, how somebody else forged theirs, but sometimes you kind of want to be untainted and go off on your own direction and do your own thing. Um, maybe that kind of right. explains so why I did. Yeah, which is kind of cool. I, I really like that aspect of it. Um, if you had one tip you could offer the home brewer out there to make their next batch better, what would that be? <laughs> well, 
it's tough to give one uh, one size fits all answer for every home brewer because <laughs> when you're working on your beer, it's kind of like peeling an onion, right? You you peel off the first layer and you just you discover there's another layer of issues that you can improve with your beer, and so you start addressing those. Then you think you have those solved. You taste your beer again, and there's something else to improve. So it's a con- continuous process. There's always something to work on. We certainly have things that we're working on with our beer, dialing in pitch rates or um, dissolved oxygen content, stuff like that. But for most home brewers, usually the place to start is fermentation. So I would say control your fermentation. Uh, specifically, you know, pay attention to your biggest levels, um, temperature, uh, pitch rate, and oxygenation. And if you can control those, you're going to be making good beer. Fantastic. Fantastic. So uh, tell me about the best beer celebration or festival that you've been to. If I'm going to something and uh, I want to taste a bunch of beers and uh, or be just amazed, where should I go? Well, the big one up here is the Washington Brewers Festival. It's uh, run by the Washington Beer Commission at, at Mary Moore Park every summer, except for this year, of course. And that's always the biggest festival in our area. That's going to be 100 all Washington breweries. Um, a lot of them bringing out all the special stuff out of the cellar that they they want to share with folks. That's always a good time. Uh, it's a whole weekend long, so it's a, a lot of beer <laughs> to be able to explore. Um, but you know what? The uh, Black Raven Flock Party, they call it. It's their anniversary party every May. They shut down the whole parking lot and share a bunch of their special barrel-aged beers and stuff like that. Uh, I haven't been to it in a long time, but when I was first getting into beer, that was one of my, my favorite breweries, number one, but events, number two, just because of how much of their specialty stuff they were able to bust out for that one party. Wow. We went to Dark Arts last year, which is Fort George's bourbon barrel-aged big party they've got, and it's kind of got this gothic thing to it and and okay. all that, and it was totally unbelievable, just ridiculous. It sells out on Black Friday within 10, 15 minutes. Oh, and uh, so I'm going to have to check out this Black Raven Festival. So, Yeah, I don't know if they'll be able to do it. We'll kind of have to see how all, all our COVID situations shake out. But hopefully we can get back to beer events soon. Yeah, absolutely. So are you a soccer fan? you like soccer? Uh, I'm a very casual Sanders, Sanders fan. <laughs> I, I'm not, Sanders I'm not going to throw any shade at the Timbers. Don't worry. Yeah, hey, we're... <laughs> From Seattle, I go to yeah. about one game a year, so I'm I'm not going to hate on the Timbers. You know, we're all from the Northwest. I, I'm not part of that rivalry, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll watch a game here and there. <laughs> so, uh, so you're a Sanders guy. You follow follow the Sanders a little bit. Um, we've had the guys from Three Magnets on. Obviously, they're a big Sanders bar. So, uh, but with that, um, again, we love we love breweries that uh, kind of follow soccer and kind of do their thing. So. I love the fact that you kind of follow the Sounders there. So, yep, I, yeah, I'm a big sports guy, but uh, Mariners and Seahawks are more my teams. I still follow the follow the SuperSonics, but I haven't gotten any updates on them lately. If, for some reason, I haven't <laughs> seen any scores come up on the feed. Well, I was looking for Sean Kemp's uh, like numbers, and I have just haven't seen them. So, um, maybe Gary is yeah. there. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, right. So, well, you guys will eventually get a team, right? So I think that will come back to you eventually. Or you can follow Oklahoma City. Yeah. Well, we got hockey, so we're we're making yeah. steps, right? We're, they get, hockey's got to have somewhere to play. Next step is basketball team. We'll get there eventually. Touché, touché. Yeah, that's right. Well, Evan, I appreciate the time. So this has been uh, very insightful. So, again, if you uh, listeners are out there listening to the podcast, and you're up in the Seattle area and you want to check out a fantastic brewery just north of Seattle, check out uh, Watts Brewing. Fantastic Colts that we've tried tonight. We'd love to try some more beers, so hopefully we can hook up with Evan and some of your beers up there. Um, but with that, uh, we appreciate your time, man. Yeah, you bet. Thanks for having me on. Good to talk to you guys. Absolutely. Yep, Thank night. you. Cool. We'll yep, kill the recording too. there. So, Evan, thanks, buddy. I appreciate it. So. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for letting me tell my story. We'll do some editing here uh, shortly, and then what we'll do is um, probably start to post this thing up so that it's on um, ACAST, and then I'll send you an email link with the link to it, so and you can promote Sounds it as uh, you see fit. Okay. That'd be awesome. Thanks, guys. Cool. All right, man. Take care. 
All right, that was Evan Watts from Watts Brewing, uh, talking a little bit about his brewing, his beer, timber soccer, not Seattle soccer. Nope. And uh, but yeah, huge thanks to Evan. So been a while since we recorded that, and uh, again, hope he's still doing well in this nasty COVID world. Yeah, very definitely. So it's interesting. So we had his bee's knees Kolsch. We're drinking a fru Kolsch right now. And yeah. his Kolsch was crystal clean, like oh, yeah. so good. Yeah. Yeah. So um, interesting. The whole story about the bees, huh? Well, the, the interesting part is, is, is that the bees that they're using don't produce honey. They're strictly pollinators. They're just a pollinator bee. Yeah. It's interesting because they are. I mean, that was my question about the uh, mead, right? And he's just mm-hmm. like, uh, no, wrong bees, jackass. Yeah. Well, and I think I think that's where the world has a misconception on on the bee world. There's, yeah, there's the honeybee, but there's also a ton of other bee species out there. That totally, are, that are strictly pollinators that are very important to the crops. Yeah. Well, so um, awesome. Like I love the love the story of new breweries opening up in the uh, general area in the Seattle and Portland areas where the beer market's already saturated. And in this COVID world, we've seen a lot of breweries fall off and go out of business. Yet there's still some of these guys that are taking advantage of that low and jumping into the market. So, And, and they're finding ways to be successful in it. That's what's impressive. Yeah, totally. Well, so you and I went out today out to a local tap house in our tap house series. Yes. And I uh, had the chance to talk with the owner, Dave, of White Oak Tap House. And awesome interview, dude. Very awesome. Yeah, cool uh, tap house, corner of Teal and uh, Murray Boulevard. So out here in Beaverton, I believe they call the area the Murray Hill area. Yeah, the Murray Hill. Yep. Yep. So, uh, but awesome little place I found about a year ago, just kind of nestled in there. And it was like right as COVID was hitting, hitting and things were being locked down. Yeah. And I'm like, how is this going to work? And here we are, a year later, and they're still, still alive. Going. Yeah. It's so. fantastic to see. Well, let's give uh, the interview a listen with Dave from the White Oak. All right. It's Jason from the Tim Beers here, and we're here uh, with Dave from White Oak Tap House. And we're... Uh, over here in Beaverton, sitting at uh, Teal and Murray, roughly. And uh, Dave, thanks for having us out to your tap house. Thank you guys for coming. It's a pleasure yeah. to be on. Absolutely. So uh, we were drawn to this place right at the beginning of COVID here. I, b- I believe March was your opening, roughly. We, we opened February 28th. So. The February 28th, okay. I remember coming in, going, I was down at Papa Murphy's uh, getting a pizza, and I was like, hey, there's a new tap house. I'm like, COVID's just hitting. I wonder what's going to happen there. And so... Uh, so you guys are still here, still standing a year later. I mean, that's fantastic. Still standing. It's still been, standing. It's been an interesting ride. Yeah, absolutely. So um, still have a decent beer selection. I think that's the thing I noticed last time we were in uh, was the beer selection always is uh, very diverse. And so it's not the stuff that I'm seeing in a lot of tap houses. Um, tell me a little bit about how you pick beers, uh, kind of what your focus is on the beer selection. So I have a list of probably... 12 to 16 styles of beer that I always want to have on tap. There's always going to be that IPA focus because that's what people, I mean, if if you look at the top selling beers every day, every week, it's always IPAs, Mm -hmm. right? So we have two West Coast IPAs, two New England style or hazy IPAs, one double IPA. So there's five IPAs almost always on tap, but then there's going to be something from Belgium or a Belgian style. Uh, my goal is not necessarily just to have local stuff, we, mostly local beer, but I also just want to get stuff that's good, right? I don't really care where it's from as long as it's, it tastes good. So something from Belgium. Right now I have one of my favorites, Bastille's Triple Carmelite. Um, a sour. There's always going to be a sour on there. Always now two ciders. I think we started with one cider, but really? now there's, there's two. So one kind of just traditional hard apple and then one flavored, not super sweet. And then a red or a brown, or a red, brown, or an amber, kind of one or two of those three. Mm -hmm. Always a stout, almost always a porter or something like that, or an imperial stout and a stout. And then a pale ale, something 
interesting like like right now I think the the interesting one is the I mean I think they're all interesting but the Imperial CDA so it's technically a black IPA but um, yeah. it's it's just I mean, different it's ten and a half percent it's absolutely delicious and then of course something easy drinking at least one lager or pilsner and then from there pale ale and then fill out the rest with whatever's whatever's sure. whatever's there. So, so so how's that work with the distributors when you're when you're approaching distributors or they're approaching you saying, "Hey, I've got this great deal on this keg." Um you, you generally have an idea of what you want in your head, but um h- how's it dealing with the distributors and again, you picking the beers that you want off of their list? Uh, there's so many distributors <laughs> that it's a, it's kind of a daunting task honestly. So you um some of them are great, some of them aren't so great as you can right. imagine. It's the same in any business. So on Mondays, I'll get the lists. Some of them are like live inventory lists. Some of them are just kind of running lists that you have to run through these massive, massive, massive lists. Other ones, you have to know exactly what you want. Otherwise, you would never find what you'd want. So basically, I look at the ones that are like live inventory first because those are typically the ones that have just a few different brands and aren't like this massive, huge inventory. So try to get on the stuff because it sells out really fast. Mm. Um, so for example, you guys know Hetty Topper, the, it's a beer from Burlington, Vermont. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So that's getting distributed out here. So that was when did that start? Like, well, that... <laughs> it's coming next, it's coming next <laughs> week. So hope to see you guys back in here. Um, it's, it's super rare out here. Yeah. Honestly, I think it's only once a year that they distribute, but, um, it's basically like being on top of it on Mondays, knowing exactly what I want and then have our guys kind of help with ideas and I want to get what sells, but I also want to get what's going to keep diverse customers coming in. Right. And I don't think that means having 10 IPAs on tap. I think that's pretty boring. Um, especially cause I mean, everybody is making hazy IPAs these days, right? Right. Right. Well, and so there's, there's the other approach, right? Where, um, I've heard others that we always keep PBR on, on tap. We always keep one that's a PBR because, we know that that one's going to sell every time somebody walks in, right? And then they've got others that are like, nope, we want diversity. This is We want something totally different than they're going to see any other place. So, so When we first opened, I had actually thought about having a couple beers kind of always on tap. Like, yeah. I love Gigantic IPA, and I was like, oh, I'll always have this on tap. So I got two kegs of it right when we opened, and then as soon as those two were gone, I said, nah, I'm going to change. <laughs> all, the ke- all the lines are constantly rotating. So um, we actually did also play around with having like a – something like a Rainier or just like a $2 beer yeah. on tap. I haven't done it yet. Uh, maybe in the future. Maybe summer day, hot summer day, yeah, post-COVID. Exactly. Right? Maybe when people are actually like hanging out inside, all when the actual bar seats are open. Because yeah. we only actually ever had bar stools for about a week and a half. And we had to take them out. <laughs> well, and hopefully that changes for you soon. Um, one of the things that I find very interesting about this area is and it, it's right on your board when you walk in, is that all the furniture or all the white oak that you see in here came from one tree. That's right. Uh, from southeast Portland. So what's the story behind that? So when uh, my business partner, my partner and I came up with the idea to open the place, my first thought was to call my buddy who's a woodworker. His name's Chris Riedel. He's a yodel boy woodworks. And got a hold of him and said, hey, I want you to build a bar for me. And his response was, well, I just got a whole bunch of white oak. How does that sound? And knowing that white oak's just a beautiful wood, as you can tell, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, it turned into this massive project from, it went from bar to bar plus ceiling thing, plus all of the tables, all the furniture, all this stuff, because he had the whole tree. So typically when a tree is cut down, for like disease or the owners want it out of their yard, it'll get wood chipped and he will salvage those trees. Or that's one of his goals is to kind of salvage those trees and then turn it into cool stuff like this. Right. Um, and we basically use all of it, every single piece of the tree. I have some pieces left that I want to turn into tap handles, but uh, that's a pretty tough process. Yeah. So yeah, it's every piece of wood, no matter how hard you look is from the same tree, the game shelf, the, Shelves behind the bar, all of the, and of course, you know, everything's custom made, so this right. triangle table is my favorite piece. And nice little bow tie in there. Yeah, 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 he does good work. Yeah, it's a fantastic story, I love that. Um, 
So when you when you think about things going forward, and we all know it's impossible to predict because we we've seen how long this this COVID stretch has gone. But where ideally do you want to be once things open back up and there you can start getting people back in and where you want to go? My goal with the space or our goal to space is for it to be like a destination spot right i mean that's kind of what i'm trying to do with like the beer cooler actually have unique rare beers that not everybody's getting um it, that's really one of the goals obviously we want all the seats full all the time right, right. who doesn't but um that's what i want is when people you go into a tap house and you drink some beers you leave and you're like eh, it's a tap house i like that place but I think when you come in here, you leave and you're like, wow, that place was really cool. Whether you love the beer or the people or not, which I think you will, I think you'll love the space. So, like, it's something that you'll remember when you leave and it's something that you'll talk about. And, you you know, you, you remember it's, – it's a really a – it looks a lot better at nighttime, the ceiling light right. fixture. But, like, yeah. this is a super unique space and that's what I want people to think about and I want people to talk about it afterwards. I don't know that I've gone to many tap houses – that I wanted to talk about afterwards. So that's kind of the main goal is to give that feeling for people to come in. Yeah, definitely. And it, and it is, it's totally different at night. So there used to be Malone's here in the corner, right? So there was yeah. a drinking establishment yeah. there for a while. And we were talking about that as we were getting ready to come in. And I'm like, they've refaced the entire shopping complex. And yeah, they made some serious upgrades here. Yeah, totally upgraded and all that. But this thing sticks out to me because again, the lighting, everything's very clean inside. Versus there's a lot of tap houses that you go to and it's a, they've got a mix of all sorts of stuff, right? They've got they've got games in a corner and there's sports stuff hanging on another wall and, and you're right. Um, you've kind of carved out that kind of a classy type style for what the neighborhood reflects, I think, here. So it'll be interesting to see when COVID pops, all of the bar stools full, right? So an outside seating so. full and everything popping. So that's excellent. Well, um, Talk to me a little bit about, um, I guess, in the COVID world, is the how you're dealing with rent and all that type of stuff. I mean, did you have a long-term lease on the thing? Have they offered you a little bit of relief? No relief? Okay. <laughs> yeah. we, we, have a, we have a pretty long-term re- lease. It's, it's five years, and there's, there's no real way to get out of it. And honestly, it's, it hasn't been too bad. Good. And if it came down to it, we would just figure out a way like a just course if we needed to start delivering beer we we totally would right it just hasn't come to that when we first closed after the first two weeks people were kind of trickling in given that you know i have a full-time job but we were working from home i was able to actually be here and we don't pay me right so it was it was a good way to offset costs we were only open for three hours a day for a shoot a few months right and then once the restrictions were lifted a little bit we were open all summer and that's when we really started getting a pretty good customer base and people started recognizing we were here we're surrounded by residential Mm -hmm. area and i'd say half or more of the people still don't know we even exist yeah so it's you know we look at the square metrics and it shows you every month like what percentage of your customers are returning customers what percentage are new customers and for most of last year almost every single month 60 to 70 percent were new customers oh, wow. first timers and it's just since switched december january was like more like 60 percent returning customers so we're starting to establish that customer base and people around the neighborhood know that we're here now so it's actually been pr- probably better than you could expect a brand new business to operate given covid hmm. so all things considered we're happy to be able to bring our bartenders back on because we still have the same two guys that we hired from the get-go um, two Decembers ago. It's also interesting that you want to do a, a beer cooler here with uh, hard to find beers and all that stuff. You've seen, I, we've seen a lot of the tap houses in town start to move towards cans and bottles and things like that just to stay alive. So, but the focus has not been those hard to, hard to reach. What are some stuff that I should find in that in the next year or so that maybe, maybe like rare stuff? So, we're not talking about Abyss. We're talking about. Yeah, right. I'm like, <laughs> oh, I got the. The new the Coco Cow up in there. Yeah. So I'm from the Midwest, uh, from Chicago. So I, I feel like I know the beers out there better than people who have never been out there. Like nobody would say, 
I know Surly. Like Surly's a fantastic brewery uh-huh. out of uh, Minneapolis. Have you heard of them? Yeah, absolutely. So I have some the beer magazines year after year, right? So yeah. Yeah. I have some Surly in there right now. And it's not that nobody else can get it, right? I typically, you, everybody has access to the same stuff. Mm-hmm. It's more about what you know than anything else. You know, you're, according to liquor laws, you can't just drive across the country and get beer right. and bring it back right. and sell it anyway. So it's not like I'm going to really have anything that nobody else can get. It's that um, back in the day when I first started, well, when I was 21, we were kind of doing the beer connoisseur thing where Beer Advocate was all the rage. We were writing the beer reviews and really got an idea for what is really good, whether it's from here, whether it's from the Europe or anywhere, right? Mm-hmm. So that's kind of the eye that I <coughs> approach looking at the lists with is I see something, I'm like, I know that this is amazing beer that I have never seen in Oregon. That's what I'm going to get, right? So Surly was just like a no-brainer. I'm like, I'm getting that beer because I love it. Mm -hmm. So I know other people love it, whether they know it or not. I'm actually seeing that in general, and maybe this is a sign of the times and just low traffic, is that people don't look at the can cooler and see the things that I see, right? And I think... It's one of the things is like our social media following is pretty small because we're new. Mm-hmm. We need to like triple, quadruple, expand that audience for them, for people that I think know the beers the way I kind of just remember them from growing up in the Midwest to see something like Surly or Toppling Goliath or anything like that and go, I have to get that. Or even honestly, Hetty Topper, which is what we're hoping for. Mm-hmm. Like, this is a beer that. Who knows who all is going to get it, but we will definitely have some, and I'm assuming people are going to come from all over. To get There's it. almost got to be a marketing blitz around it, right? We're in, we're in the beer mech, and I think it's very hard for us to forget sometimes that we've got access to so many good beers, um, irregardless of where you go. And in the Midwest for a long time, I mean, it, w- it was tough to find a good beer. I was in Dallas, Dallas, Texas in the late 90s, and I remember bass beer was it i mean that's yeah, the best sure. you could find right or bush and all the other stuff you're right though we're, we're inundated in good beer so the question really is like is heady topper that much better than anything else right i don't think i don't think so it's right. not necessarily that it's better. but it's the nostalgia that's in the head of what heady topper was it's mystique too, yeah. right hey i can only get this once a year it's just like all those russian imperial stouts totally they're great you know like you can only get bourbon county stout on <laughs> the day you can only get dark lord from on dark lord day and it's like there's that huge mystique and there's these massive lines. But it's Pliny, right? Pliny's the local legend, fairly local legend, where everybody still goes after Pliny. Right? Pliny's pretty darn good. It is, it yeah. is pretty <laughs> good, for sure. But it's like, is it that much better than all the other beers? Right. Not necessarily, right. but should you try it? Absolutely, yeah. right. Because it is if the gold you standard. Get it, you should yeah. absolutely go get it. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. Pallet Jack was never put into cans, right? So Barley Browns wasn't doing that. COVID hits, they're doing cans. Uh, Ro- uh, not Rogue, but uh, Boneyard said they were never, ever going to do cans. And then literally a month after our interview with uh, those guys, they were like in cans because people had to do stuff to survive. Everybody's in cans now. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> and it's, it's also funny because like people will buy, they want 16-ounce cans. Right. Way more than they want 12-ounce cans. It amazes me. Yeah. And that's basically, well, I'm trying to only get 16-ounce cans in the cooler because... The 12 ounce cans end up sitting there longer. Yeah. It's pretty interesting. But that was the death of the bomber, these 16 ounce cans, right? They got rid of the 22 ounce bottles totally. because the 16 ounce cans can fit easier on a rack and they can fit more of them. So, exactly. but I'm missing out on all my ounces there. So, but <laughs> <laughs> the, the aluminum shortage hit and that has caused just ripples and waves throughout the industry. How has that impacted you as far as being able to get the beers that you're looking for to bring in? Actually, I think the the main problem with getting beer has been that, as far as I know, a lot of breweries have shifted towards canning and right. away from draft. Yeah. So if I go look at a massive list, sometimes there's only a few kegs of a beer because the you know the brewery's only distributing a few, keeping most for in house, and then just canning the rest and selling it that way. So I haven't I haven't not been able to get 21 taps filled. But that has been an issue when I'm like, I want this beer, I want this brewery, or something like that. I ended up not being able to get them because they're not kegging as much, hmm. or um, not not as much draft is being produced, which is good. Well, Dave, we appreciate your time here at uh, White Oak. So to the listeners, definitely come check this place out. So it's at the shopping complex that's uh, 
here at Teal and Murray. So, uh, and you'll see a Safeway and Applina Fitness and all that there. Fantastic setting. Uh, awesome story about the White Oak. And then the beer selection is always, like I said, primo. So when you walk in, um, they've got 20 plus taps, uh, very, very different stuff that you're not going to find at any other tap house. So, but we appreciate it, man. Thank yeah, you. I appreciate you guys very much. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely. Take care. All right. There you go. Dave from the White Oak Tap House. Yes. So, uh, awesome story on the tap house itself and the wood that's within. And the wood is gorgeous. It, it, it really draws your eye to the bar, the lighting area. I mean, like he said, everything in there that is wood came from that tree. No, it's gorgeous. And I remember, uh, again, I think I was there in an evening, and it does. It just kind of glows, and the white light kind of bounces off and works with the oak that's in there. Yeah. It's, it's almost like a club inside, like a... Ooh. Oomch, 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 oomch. <laughs> So, um, but it's it's a pretty cool place, man. I, I I'm like having some pops there. So yeah, and what's nice is it's within walking distance for me to just go up over the hill, have a few beers, walk back home. Yep, no, it is. It's Perfect. totally. And we found out they have these awesome crawlers. Oh yeah, reusable crawlers. That's right. So that's fantastic. Little uh, lid on the top that you screw on. It seals. We'll see how, how it holds a seal, but. Yeah. Uh, Ended up with a uh, Pano Pineapple Kolsch. Listeners will remember that that's my favorite Kolsch there of a domestic Kolsch. Um, and then what else do they have? I got a, uh, oh, I got a raspberry oh, IPA. A, yeah. Yeah, from raspberry. Integrity Brewing out of Aloha. I think it was what? A, was it a double or a triple? It's a double IPA. Double yeah. IPA. Yeah. yeah. It's like 90 IBU and, mm. yeah, so. And then you ended up. You got the Pano, and then you got something else. Um, I believe I went with the Pano, and then I also went with the uh, Belgian Triple. Oh, yeah, yeah. Which is incredibly smooth. Yeah, that, that was, was actually the true Belgian. It right? was, yeah. yeah. I, I think they, on their website, the recipe that they were talking about using on that beer is from like the 1600s. Yeah. So no, it, it is a definitely old, old recipe, which is amazing. Yeah, and you said it was super smooth. Yeah, so yeah, it's crazy. Interesting stuff, man. Well, so big thanks again to uh, both Evan and Dave for their time. Yeah. So, uh, again, we always love talking to brewers. We always love talking to the local tap houses, see what's going on. And we're glad that each are doing okay in this well, COVID world. And a cool thing that, that Dave brought up in his beer selection was that the beers that he's selecting, it, it's not that everybody can't get them. It's that they're just choosing not to get them. Yep. I'm noticing a lot of the tap houses around here are trying to keep everything local. And Dave's like, eh, that's fine. But there's other beers that are fantastic that we can get that nobody knows about. Well, and he said that. He wants the best beers exactly. that he can tap. Not necessarily the, the best local beers. Exactly. Right? And I love that about that. Yeah, so... If you can get a keg full of Pliny the Younger, then I'll live there, I'll right on his front deck. So, Dave, if you're listening, get Pliny the Younger, man, and just send me some digits and say, hey, we got Pliny in. You don't want the elder? You want the younger? No, I want the younger. Oh. I like him young. Yeah. <laughs> I'm talking about beers, dude. Oh, I, oh, I know. <laughs> yeah. Believe me. Well, so what's going on brew wise with you? You uh, brew anything? You planning a brew day? Um, at some point, I am planning a brew day. Okay. Uh, I plan on doing the white stout. Um, I picked up a a bean, a coffee bean. Yeah. For that, from Guinness of all places, they did a, a limited run of a coffee bean roasted at the same temperatures that they kiln their uh, malts at. So it's going to be really interesting to, to see how that plays out in a beer. Yeah, it was a super uh, smooth coffee. I mean, you got me some for Christmas, and super, super smooth. Um, almost a kind of a really delicate dark chocolate. So it'll play well, I think. Yeah, it'll be nice. That'll so be I'm, I'm looking at that in probably the next uh, three weeks or so. 
Excellent. So uh, you're going to do that. I haven't brewed. We were just talking, and I'm like, I haven't brewed since September. What the no. heck's going on? You've been doing a lot of hand sanitizer. I've been doing a lot of hand sanitizer. I made some uh, rum-scented san- hand sanitizer, <laughs> and uh, we've got some tequila-scented hand sanitizer going on. So, uh, yeah, that that whole world's interesting, I'll tell you, because it's, it's beer-making is all it is. Yeah, but but it's, from what you're telling me, it's beer-making without having to be really clean about it. Yeah, well, it, it's... In certain aspects. It's interesting because the funky, certainly the funkier you are with some of your mashes, the better the product is that yeah. comes out. Yeah, it's so, crazy. Yeah, I don't... It's interesting. Um... And then the other side of that is, like, with rums, I mean, they use, like, basically old rotten fermented mash to actually make the rum taste better. So, oh, that's crazy. So it's dunder. Yeah, it's uh, crazy stuff. So It's counterintuitive to a beer maker. Totally, totally. Well, what I did not do this year is I did not do an Into the Abyss. And I did the Black Widow. So I guess I did do one in October. Yeah, you so, did. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I need to jump back in the saddle and see what we got to go. I'm guessing probably just go light right off the bat. Maybe I'll do my Pineapple Kolsch clone. There you go. So there you go. But, uh, yeah. And then we got soccer coming up. We do. Summer Lake soccer. Summer Lake. Got to get back on that. That's going to be hard for you to make, dude. Yeah, I'm pretty much not going to make it. <laughs> um, Unless we play on the weekends. Yeah, that's the only way I would make it. From a you know, work schedule of 1 in the afternoon till 9 at night, eh, it doesn't bode well for a 5.30 soccer game. Yeah, we'll just have to invert it. 5.30 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Nikolai, what do you think of that? <laughs> so. uh, those guys might actually love that. Yeah, I know. They that's might. what's crazy about yeah. it. Yeah, I think they'd love a weekend game, too. I know yeah, we've uh, played some Saturday evenings, so yeah, that might work. It's just everybody travels and wants to vacation on the weekend. So. True. Yeah. True. Good. All right, man. Well, uh, listeners, it's been a long time. I hope you enjoyed the interviews there from the White Oak Tap House and with uh, Evan Watts from Watts Brewing. Um, we will have more coming at you soon. I believe we've got some uh, other interviews that are banked here. Yes. Plus some other stuff that's on its way. And, um, again, so look for the next podcast episode of the Portland Timbers podcast coming soon. So till then, take care. Cheers. Timbers. Thanks for listening to the Portland Tim Beers Podcast. Be sure to visit the Portland Tim Beers Podcast on ACAST.com to join the conversation, access the show notes, and discover our fantastic bonus content. If you love the Tim Beers Podcast, we'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and give a review on iTunes. Until next time, Tim Beers. Tim Beers.